hello then, everyone. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, this is my first Yocto Developer Summit. Um, so I'm really happy to be here uh, today to talk to you about Parsec uh, and its integration into Yocto. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Paul, I'm here from Arm, where I work as a solutions architect based in Cambridge, UK. I'm one of the Parsec project maintainers uh, and I'm a tech lead for ARM's contributions into this project. Um, now, sadly, my co-speaker, my intended co-speaker, Anton, uh, he's not able to be with me here today to share the presentation with me. Um, I'd like to introduce him anyway, because uh, his is certainly a name worth knowing. He did the majority of the work uh, to integrate Parsec um, into Yocto for the hard not release. So quick rundown of the agenda. I'm gonna start by explaining what Parsec is, um, what is the problem it's solving, and just very briefly look at its architecture. And then I'll explain a little bit about how you can actually use uh, and benefit from Parsec in your Yocto-based deployments. And the last section, I'll go into a little more technical detail about the inclusion of Parsec into Yocto. And I'm just gonna spend some time sharing our experiences of that integration uh, with a particular focus on the use of the Rust language. Um, and hopefully I will leave some time at the end uh, of all of that for questions, but for now, um, let's get started. So Parsec, it's short for the Platform Abstraction for Security. What does that mean? Um, why do we need it? So we're used to running applications in the cloud. And the tools and techniques that we use for doing that are well established and understood. But there are some very good reasons, in fact, for bringing some of those workloads out of the cloud and running them at the edge, where they can be closer to endpoint devices that are generating the data that our applications are processing. So if we have a machine learning application, uh, for example, then we want to situate that as close to the data source as we can so that we don't have to send all of that raw data all of the way back to the cloud before we can gain insights from it. So what then if we want to migrate an application from cloud to edge? Well, we encounter a couple of problems. The first is that we're in a very different threat environment, actually. Our edge devices might be exposed to threats that don't exist in a managed cloud. Um, we want the best possible protection for secure assets on a device, such as private keys. That's almost certainly going to mean that we want some hardware protection locally uh, for those assets. But here's our second problem, is how do we do that? Because we have a diversity of platforms to consider not just different operating systems and CPU architectures, but also different kinds of routes of trust uh, and facilities for secure storage. So we might have access to trusted platform modules or hardware security modules, some other kind of secure element, um, or we could have something that's firmware based, something like a secure key storage service or a cryptographic service running in a trusted execution environment. Now, when our applications run at the edge, they're going to want to consume these features, no doubt. Um, but we don't really want our application code to be tightly coupled to those systems. It's not only going to be quite hard to learn how to use them, but the code is not going to be portable to a different environment. So how can we retain um, a portable and cloud native solution for our applications whilst also getting access um, to these essential but highly variable hardware security features. And that's where Parsec comes in. So Parsec, one second, lost focus. There we go. Parsec's a public open source software project. It's a software service. It bundles with it all of the specialized knowledge needed to make use of these hardware security features that we find throughout our ecosystem. Now, Parsec takes care of the complexity of consuming those facilities. And Parsec then exposes them via a flexible API contract that can be adapted into any programming language that we want to use. And it gives us APIs that are portable, that are more convenient, and can deal with multiple applications running as well. And therefore, able to give us um, a cloud native experience for application programming and deployment at the edge 
using the best available hardware security, but without any tight coupling uh, or specialized knowledge. So this is the problem space. Um, let's take a look at the anatomy of Parsec then and see how it addresses this need. So here we go, a lightning tour of Parsec architecture. A Parsec is essentially all a host local architecture. So everything you see here, you can think of as running on a node of some kind, image with a Yocto Linux distro, and including whatever applications and services the deployment needs, but it's all local. There's no network traffic here, at least as far as Parsec itself is concerned. A Parsec runs as a software service. It's a daemon, it runs in user space, and its job is to represent whatever hardware security facilities are available in the host. So be that a TPM or an HSM secure element or something else, um, Parsec represents those facilities and then surfaces a completely portable and uniform API uh, into applications. And that uniform API uh, is all based on underlying contracts that are derived from platform security architecture or PSA. A PSA is an IoT industry standard for best practices in security. It includes API suites for things like key management, uh, cryptography, storage and uh, attestation. So these PSA contracts represent the core of communication with the Parsec service. As for the service itself, the big blue box in the middle, uh, it's written in Rust. Now we think Rust was a perfect language for Parsec. Uh, it gives us leanness, it gives us good performance characteristics, but it also gives us great safety and security guarantees as well. Applications consume Parsec security services through a client library in the programming language of their choice. So Parsec is not a C API specifically. Parsec actually uses protobuf contracts and the wire protocol. And we can skim that into any programming language we choose. We can do that in a way that's ergonomic and it's going to be sensible um, for and approachable for developers um, in that language. Now, the service itself has a front end listener component, um, which receives API requests from applications. It has some access control and brokering logic that it uses in multi tenant scenarios to keep applications hygienically separated from each other. And then, lastly, in the back end, it has these so called provider modules. And this is where we isolate all of the complexity and hardware specific code uh, for talking to those TPMs, those HSMs secure elements and so forth. So it's a totally fluent and portable experience for developers on the application side uh, in whatever programming language they would prefer to use. Now, if you want to visualize Parsec within the landscape of security APIs, then this diagram can help with that. If you're familiar, for example, with older and more entrenched API standards, um, things like OASIS PKCS 11, for instance, you might naturally wonder where Parsec sits relative to those, um, and indeed, why you might want to consume Parsec APIs instead. The PKCS 11 standard, that's been in use for many years, uh, growing uh, from its original use case with smart cards, eventually becoming the preferred standard for HSMs. Um, and its broad industry adoption has over time resulted in it also being a popular choice for shimming to other technologies as well. And that's led to a large number of PKCS 11 library implementations being available. Um, and what you quickly find actually is that no two of them are precisely alike, um, despite the fact that they follow a standard. The standard allows for enough implementation quirks uh, to start causing you a headache um, if you need to be interoperable with a large number of them. So Parsec is aiming to solve this problem centrally as well in one place. Um, part of the way it does that, in fact, is to avoid PKCS 11 shims where possible. Um, it interfaces instead directly with the other APIs that are available. So things like TPM 2.0, Crypto Authlib, for instance, um, and it can use PKCS 11 if, if that's the primary interface available. Um, and as we encounter more and more hardware platforms, Parsec will be the place um, where we deal with all of these uh, various quirks. And 
besides these problems of complexity and interop headaches that you have you have to deal with the fact that these more established apis are invariably defined in c and this doesn't preclude you from calling them from other languages of course um, but you'd need to use foreign function interfaces to do that and that can also give you headaches that can give you headaches from a security standpoint and parsec tries to address this too because only the parsec service backends the providers are calling these apis and so those backends are all implemented with rust they still have to call c um, but we can invest in these safe rust wrapper layers around the raw c contracts and carefully audit all of those call out points um, and thus not have to worry about general c interoperability or ffi layers so you can interface your applications down here certainly uh, but then you're exposed to all of those interop issues that parsec aims to solve centrally now parsec is not trying to throw just another standard into that mix um, along the lines of the the now infamous xkcd cartoon if you've seen it about uh, competing standards i should have it in my slides um parsec actually uses an existing standard so it's the one from psa as its core set of primitives and this one is is very up to date it's very strongly specified it's a solid foundation on which to build this language independent layer and again there's, there's no foreign function interface here there's no calling through to c functions all of the parsec client libraries talk over the wire pro protocol to the service and it's the service that then handles the c functions through those audited code points um, that i mentioned now bundle that with a generally more fluent and convenient programming experience and also an identity management subsystem uh, to, to isolate different clients from each other in terms of their key access, then hopefully you'll understand why Parsec, consuming Parsec up here uh, is a very different proposition from consuming uh, those various other APIs. And we hope it's a favorable comparison. So where, where is Parsec sitting in the ecosystem today? So it's part of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, uh, or CNCF. It's a public open source project. It's a sandbox project inside CNCF. Uh, it's very collaborative. It was seeded into GitHub originally by Arm and Docker back in 2019. Uh, Arm is still contributing regularly, and we have this growing number of contributors, integrators, and innovators working either on Parsec or with Parsec. We're seeing integrations into other open source projects too, like Spiffy and Spire. Uh, we're seeing commercial use of Parsec in production uh, with products like Pelion Edge. And since it became a CNCF sandbox project last year, that really has opened up Parsec and we've seen steady growth uh, and interest. And what we find increasingly is that people just want Parsec to be there in the distro. Uh, so they can pick up its APIs, code against them, they then know they're getting the best hardware security that they can get, but without locking themselves into all of those specific and specialized APIs. So to that end, uh, Fedora has been packaging Parsec since Fedora 33, and OpenSUSE um, has started packaging Parsec since the Tumbleweed release. So Parsec's availability and footprint within the Linux world is, is starting to grow. And that naturally brings us to Yocto, uh, which is why I'm here today. Because Parsec and Yocto are very well matched. And, and for some of the reasons shown here, uh, architecture neutrality, platform diversity, commitment to a common dev experience and open development. Um, but I think most importantly, Yocto and Parsec are playing on the same turf in terms of where they bring the most value. So it's those IoT and uh, edge platform deployments where there's a need for heavy customization and where the underlying hardware anatomy can be highly varied as well. And it's exactly in these cases where you want the best available security coupled with um, a portable developer experience. You don't want to rewrite your applications for every platform, but you certainly do want confidence in your application's security posture. So Parsec is addressing exactly that problem. So it makes perfect sense to bring Parsec to the Yocto project. Um, and it brings me lots of pleasure 
uh, to be here today telling you that Parsec recipes now exist uh, in the meta security layer, layer and they are available from hard not um, onwards. Excuse me, right. So it's there and you probably want to know how to use it. How can you benefit from Parsec? So Parsec is this software service uh, and it's presenting security APIs to applications. So if we're going to benefit from Parsec, then we need the service to be installed and running and we need to consume the APIs. Again, Parsec being a host local architecture means there isn't a huge amount of setup and orchestration to worry about um, across nodes. Uh, so firstly, of course, we need to include the meta Parsec layer and its dependencies into image builds just to get the pieces we need into place. There's also a configuration step to manage at deployment time. Now, Parsec is designed to connect with all of these different hardware security solutions, as I mentioned before, um, but it does require some configuration, some intelligence uh, being supplied to it in order to do that. Um, there's a TOML file, in fact, which tells Parsec which of its backends should be enabled and what parameters are needed to talk to the locally available TPMs or HSMs and so forth. This configuration is needed, but it isn't particularly complicated. And the default TOML file that's in the recipe has examples for typical use cases. And I'm going to show you a bit later how you can override the recipe to provide your own preferred configuration as well. As for running the service, well, it is just a daemon. Um, that we recommend using systemd uh, to manage the lifecycle. Um, you can do it with init scripts as well. Uh, we support both, but systemd is recommended. And once Parsec is configured and running, there are various options for consuming the portable API. Uh, there is um, a self-contained command line client, which you can just use in shell or scripting contexts. That's called Parsec tool. And Parsec tool is actually packaged in the Yocto recipes as well. So if you want that on the system, again, just include it in the image. The Parsec tool isn't the only option. Uh, we have client libraries now starting to be built in different programming languages for Parsec. You can consume those portable APIs through those routes as well. Now, since these are per language libraries, uh, you don't really find them in Yocto recipes. It's more the concern of an individual application to, to go and link through the language ecosystem to, to go and find the dependency um, and link with them and include them uh, in the familiar way. And as for what the APIs look like, uh, I have a couple of quick examples I can show you. And both of these are going to show the creation of um, an ECC key pair for elliptic curve digital signatures. And we're going to sign a short message. So here's how we would do it with the command line tool. This is just some shell transcript on screen. Uh, you can see it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's just a command to create the key pair, a command to sign the message, which gives us a nice base 64 of the signature. And then lastly, we can export the public part of the key for onward verification. And, and that gives us a nice convenient pen format. And that will be highly compatible with other tools. Uh, these examples I'm showing you, by the way, they were taken from another Parsec presentation that uh, one of my colleagues did at the Cloud Native Rust Day earlier this month, uh, which is why, which was part of KubeCon, and that's why these examples are talking about Cloud Native Rust Day. And speaking of Rust, here's the same thing uh, with the same steps, and hopefully you'll see that the code footprint is pretty small. Um, one of the things we're aiming for with Parsec, in fact, is, is quite a streamlined and approachable programming experience um, in a variety of languages. And that really completes the overview of Parsec itself um, in terms of what it does and how it works and how you can use it. So this, if you like, is the end of the main part of the presentation. Um, I do have some additional slides and the focus on these uh, is more about our experiences of integrating Parsec into Yocto. And that's particularly since Parsec is built mostly from Rust-based components. And if you're interested in the more general area of integrating Rust-based software into Yocto, um, then I would point you towards a session that's happening in the presentation room a little later, 
uh, that Stephen Walters talk using Rust with BitBake and MetaRust. And that I'm sure will go into more this in, in more detail. But I'm just going to lightly cover some of the details of how we approached it uh, with Parsec. So first of all, when you need to add a Rust-based component into Yocto, you're faced principally with two choices. How do you get the tool chain? And how do you manage your dependencies? The tool chain refers, of course, to the Rust compiler and also Rust's integrated build system, uh, which, if you're not familiar, that's called Cargo. And when we talk about dependencies, we're talking about the many library components um, that your project is likely to be depending on. Uh, libraries in Rust, we call them crates. Um, and any project is, of course, likely to depend on several of these. And certainly Parsec is uh, no exception. There are Yocto layers that provide the toolchain in different ways. Um, we have Meta Rust, which builds the entire toolchain all the way from source code. There is Meta Rust bin, uh, which provides pre built binaries instead uh, for the Rust tools just based on the available upstream. Um, now, unsurprisingly, it's faster to use pre built in terms of your image build time, but it does offer less flexibility both in terms of the toolchain itself, but also with the dependency management, which I'll talk about. So Meta Rust is what we use uh, for, for Parsec. Now, I said that this helps with dependency management. And one of the things that Meta Rust provides is a means of managing trait dependencies using BitBake. There's tooling provided uh, to walk over your dependency graph in a Rust project and figure out all of the crates and the versions that you need um, in, in the closure of dependencies. And essentially just outputs a file that you can then include um, into your recipe. And this is called BitBake Vendoring. And it's the recommended way to manage dependencies when using Meta Rust. Um, just quickly, there is an alternative. You can disable that uh, with the, the magic flag shown there. Um, and that will switch over to just using Cargo's built-in dependency management, where Cargo goes and discovers the crates it needs and, and goes and pulls them. Um, this means that you don't need to have all of your dependencies explicitly modeled in your Yocto recipes, but it's not recommended because you, you haven't got that same consistency guarantee uh, from one build to another, um, and you can't use the BitBake state cache uh, to build offline. So for Parsec integration, uh, we chose the BitBake dependency management mechanism. Uh, again, I think many more details of Meta Rust and BitBake will be covered in Stephen's talk later on. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to uh, go check that session out uh, in the presentation room later. This is a snippet of the Parsec service Yocto recipe itself. Um, and I'll just highlight a few characteristics of it. Uh, using the Meta Rust layer is quite simple. So after adding it to your layers config list, you can inherit a class. There is a cargo class. Um, you can define the source URI for your Rust project. Um, you can use HTTP or Git links, but you can also use these crate links, which are supported by the cargo class. Um, you can define cargo build parameters if necessary. They will all just get passed through to the cargo build system. Uh, in, in this example, you can see some that, that double slash feature, uh, double dash features switch. Um, that's essentially Rust's conditional compilation mechanism. So we're asking Parsec to be built with all providers, which means all of the backend modules uh, being available in the runtime. And we can define dependencies, any other standard methods you might need uh, in the recipe, and the use of the CLang LLVM toolchain, uh, which we need for building some pieces of Parsec um, as well. This line here. Uh, so I talked about this earlier. This is of interest. So this is where we specify the TOML config file for Parsec, uh, which I talked about earlier. Remember, we said this is one of the things you might want to customize uh, in your own image build if you're using Parsec. This is where you can use a BB append. Um, you can specify your own preferred service configuration. So say, for example, if you know that your image is going to run on a hardware platform where there is, for example, a TPM available, for instance, then you could supply some suitable TPM configuration um, in BB append like this, and that will just overwrite um, 
the default one uh, as you'd expect. And lastly, so just a word on the image build times. Uh, when using MetaRust, they can be long. Um, and if you're using these layers in your images, then you are almost certainly going to want to use some state caching, uh, if at all possible. Uh, so what we recommend actually is, is, um, is to put sstateDir and dldir on a persistence and shared file system. And you can make this file system available by mounting it into the Docker containers that are executing your CI builds. So these are containers that would otherwise provide fresh environments for each build. But that mounted volume then gives us a persistent state cache as well. So you get the best of both worlds effectively. Um, and this solution can then be used to significantly improve uh, your build time. You know, once, you've, once you've done the slow part once, uh, you, you have it cached. Um, and obviously it, it speeds up the subsequent builds. There's a snippet there of a GitLab um, CI config file from MetaArm. Um, where the persistent directories are defined via environment variables. And that actually brings me to the end. So I've talked about why Parsec exists, what it does, um, how you can make use of it in Yocto images, and a few details about our experiences with integrating a Rust-based project uh, into Yocto. Um, if this presentation has intrigued you about Parsec, and I, well, I hope it has, uh, then here are some useful links for learning more. It's all open source, uh, so the code's available right there in uh, GitHub. There's also an online book uh, with quite a wealth of documentation about the project, along with things like API specs, uh, we have published threat models and, and um, lots of details about how things work uh, internally. There's also a growing community uh, around Parsec that anyone is very welcome to join. Um, lots of community resources there on GitHub, including meeting minutes and presentations. Uh, we're a public CNCF project, as I mentioned. Um, we communicate mostly on Slack. Uh, there's a Parsec channel there in the CNCF workspace. Um, again, anyone's welcome to join uh, that workspace, it's a, and it's a public channel. We hold weekly community meetings on Tuesdays at the time shown. Uh, also public, again, anybody is welcome to pop in. Uh, there is public agenda also, so you can add yourself if you want to come into one of those meetings and introduce yourself and maybe talk about a Parsec use case or a contribution opportunity, then we'd be very happy to see you. And that's it. Uh, so let me, um, let me leave it there and open the floor to any questions. And um, once again, thank you very much for giving me the slot today. <laughs>